That's right, we are back with, uh, it's actually session two. It's the third episode of uh, just taking a look at amillennial issues with dispensationalism, uh, which also can include post-millennial issues. Today, what I want to do is I want to take a look at, at the term um, apocalyptic. Probably the issue is speaking at cross purposes. So when we say apocalyptic, um, different people will mean different things when they say apocalyptic. The world, when they say apocalyptic, um, specifically they're talking about something that sounds um, disastrous, catastrophic. You know, oh no, it was apocalyptic. You know, the Dow Industrial nosedived so many points, it's apocalyptic. The hurricane, oh no, it was, uh, it was apocalyptic. And uh, so they'll mean it's something that's catastrophic. And very often, um, it'll get kind of confused in the same kind of language as Armageddon. It, 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 people yell Armageddon all the time. Armageddon's a specific location on the world. Um, it's in the Valley of Megiddo, and it's a specific battle, a war, a global war that takes place uh, in the very last days. But people say Armageddon when they're, they're talking about something being disastrous. You know, uh, a great catastrophe. Oh, no, it was Armageddon. Um, so, anyway, there's this apocalyptic language, sometimes referred to as apocalyptic literature. What the dispensationalist will mean when they say something is apocalyptic literature is they'll mean specifically end times. So, in other words, you know, the book of Joel or other minor prophets, Micah, or you're talking about certain passages in Ezekiel and in, in Daniel, God's judgment upon the earth, the day of the Lord, um, uh, that day or at that time, this will happen. So you you will see that kind of um, language where God is talking about. So this is apocalyptic language because it speaks specifically concerning the very end, the very last things um, leading up to and including Christ's return, particularly all millennial folks and uh, post mill folks. When they mean apocalyptic literature, it means more than just the subject matter. What they mean is it's a, they mean it's a particular genre of scripture that is fraught with symbolism, figurative language, that uh, you can't really understand exactly what's going on just by reading the text in a straightforward way. There's subtext, there's symbolism in there, so you can't just take the words to mean just what they say. Um, the historicist type of point of view is like the amillennialist or the post that who will believe that a lot of the apocalyptic language, especially from the book of Revelation, it um, pretty much all happened, or most of it happened, in 70 AD. So the historicists will talk about symbolism, and they're going to discuss it in those terms, because what they're doing is, really, is they're setting you up for understanding um, it's symbolic. You cannot understand yourself. It's apocalyptic literature, because it is... The nature is symbolism, and because it is apocalyptic, and apocalyptic language is so symbolic, um, so pay no attention to that text behind the curtain. Uh, it's you can't you can't nail it all down. You, you can't necessarily nail it all down. Um, we're only to understand it in vague and kind of nebulous, mysterious terms. Again, who gets to determine the meaning? Who gets to decide which parts are what? And what they want to do is they want to nudge you down this kind of merry path, um, but press them because they have the right answers, okay? Um, they want you to swallow that hook, line, and sinker because um, they've got issues with Revelation chapter 20. So if in the book of Revelation in particular, if they can get you to swallow that, well, it's all figurative, it's symbolic, you can't really nail it down that easy, it's not one of what's obviously presented in front of you, you can't take it that way. Then they can get you to swallow that, even though the word thousand is in Revelation 20 six times, that it doesn't really mean thousand. So, I, you know, we want to know the rules, okay? So if we're not going to accept that as literal, and we have to accept it as symbolic, I want to know the reason why. Well, let's take a look at a couple of those things, but they, they want you to just take that it means a really, just kind of generally a really long time. They want you to buy in. Uh, to the presupposition of kingdom eventually, um, that we must work toward, like post mill, or that kingdom is now, but it's in heaven. To do that, you must make it plain and clear in the writing of Revelation that 
um, Revelation 20 is 1,000, but it, even though it's stated six times, that it really just means not anything literal, just a really long time. Okay, the go-to, of course, is to mock dispensationalism, because, um, you know, we'll say, you got to be consistent in your hermeneutic. Um, and then they'll try to also accuse us of not believing in any symbolism at all. Their favorite go-to is to go all the way back to the 60s, late great planet Earth, resurrect that old Hal Lindsey book, and say, Hal Lindsey said, suggested that maybe um, th these uh, demonic creatures coming out of the abyss in Revelation chapter 9 are, you know, Huey helicopters or some something like that. But um, I don't know anybody who believes that. But that's the famous go-to. That's the straw man to say, look how funny these dispensationalists, they believe, you know, helicopters in Revelation chapter 9, ha, ha, ha. So my question is, is why do they have such an issue with um, the thousand years? Why is why, why is that an issue? Why would you resist that? Why why not just take it for what it says? You see, you've got an issue here because uh, after this really long time, since thousand isn't thousand, as they say, then after this really long time, Satan's released. You've, you've got to pie that off because that's in Revelation chapter 22. So after a really long time, He's released a massive army and goes after Christ on his throne. Well, then if you're all male, you've got an issue because you're saying, well, no, kingdom is right now in heaven. Okay, so um, there's asps in heaven and little children and pits, and the kids can play with asps, uh, and there's wolves and lambs laying down together. Um, there's also cattle up there in heaven, and you have a rebellion against Satan in heaven. So there's all kinds of issues with saying kingdom is now, but it's, it's in heaven. Well, no, Satan is bound, and he's bound now, okay? Um, who is the prince of the power of the air? We read that Satan is like a roaring lion in the streets seeking whom he may devour. So um, he's the god of this age, the god of this world, we read. Is he or is he not? Or is he bound now? But if, if we keep finding passages that we cannot reconcile with our doctrine, it's a slippery, it's a slippery slope to just say, well, that must be symbolic then. Well, you can have a reason, a precedence for determining um, that it's symbolic and not just, well, because I don't want it to be literal. We, we don't get to pay, play uh, fast and loose with the scripture like that. Uh, let's look at the numbers. Let's look at the numbers there. you got seven churches. Were those seven literal churches in chapter 1? got that in verse 1, 4, 11, and 19. Uh, seven lampstands, seven golden lampstands. you got seven stars. Um, so what you've got is it, the scripture says in verse 19 exactly what these are, and they all refer to church. So the text itself will explain whether it's symbolic or not. If you have a big red dragon, is there a big red dragon any place on the earth in nature normally? No. You know, and it's got uh, seven heads and ten horns. Ha, ha, ha. Well, yeah. And you know what the funny thing is? Is you go down and you continue reading in the same chapter, and it explains the meaning of what the dragon is. And what the horns mean and what the heads are and it's not the way to um, win the argument is by mocking someone else and and um, essentially bearing false witness I think somewhere says that that's wrong I know I probably stand alone in this perspective but I frankly I don't believe there is an apocalyptic genre I don't um, if symbolism is what determines apocalyptic or merely talking about the end times is apocalyptic if it's if symbolism is the key then then maybe the psalms are apocalyptic literature because there's a lot of that in there and a lot in there about judgment so the term apocalyptic itself um, is from the book of revelation which is the apocalypse the apocalypse and so it's the apocalyptic language well, again, it doesn't mean disaster and catastrophe. Apocalypse just means the unveiling, the revealing, the disclosure, if you will, of Jesus Christ. It's the revealing, the revelation of Jesus Christ. They want you to believe it's the opposite of that. And somehow it's the obfuscation of Jesus Christ. If it's apocalyptic, then it means it's shrouded in mystery and it's symbolic. And, and you can't just take it for what it says because it's all, you know, mysterious. And that's the point. Um, it's the Son of Man coming in and... Uh, in all of the glory, fulfilling all the Old Testament prophetic prophecies and how this plays out. And the book of Revelation shows us how all these are going to play out, not with all the details. And sure, there's a lot of mysterious things that you got to dig, but you can go back into as far as Exodus um, in some places and reveal um, what these some of these passages are talking about. You don't have to go back to just Daniel or just Ezekiel or whatever. 
So what, what's the, what they want you to believe in is all this is symbolic language for the stuff that happened in 70 AD when Jerusalem was sacked. But just because there's symbolism doesn't mean it's apocalyptic language. Um, Song of Solomon is, is, is the Song of Solomon uh, an apocalyptic writing, apocalyptic language? It's symbol. So it, it's like it's absurd. I'm using absurdity to illustrate. I'm not mocking. I'm just trying to use absurdity to illustrate that you take it far enough and, and, and it falls apart on the face of it. We want you to believe that apocalyptic or the revealing means the exact opposite of what the word really means. So as Indy Goldman Toya said, I do not think that word means what you think it means. It's, uh, it, it is the disclosure of Jesus Christ, not the shrouding. So the dispensational premillennialists will say that there is symbolism but um, there are some basic tenets some rules to help determine where the, that is and what the meaning is. And I say um, probably most that I've ever met understand and just believe it as you just read it in a straightforward, normal fashion until you slam up against a wall that doesn't make much sense or you can't comprehend. And so you got to dig, you've got to look at the context, you've got to look at other Bible passages. Synthesis is, means it's the same author as the author of all, the Holy Spirit, right? So look at the word, the word thousand, though. They would tell us it's symbolic, and I say, what's your precedence? Why, why, was it, why is it symbolic? So we have to look at how the number's used and how, how John uses numbers elsewhere in the book, how thousand used elsewhere in the book, and also you can look and see how thousand is used in the Bible. Every time in the book of Revelation, John says the word thousand, it looks to me like he means thousand. Very often, as happens in Hebrew writings, is um, you'll have exaggerative language that, uh, you know, to convey a meaning. So you do have to look at that and consider whether that's the case. But we can't just be arbitrary and decide because it doesn't fit our particular um, preference that, you know, it must be symbolic or it must be literal, either one way or the other. I mean, we have to be honest with the text. If thousand does not mean thousand in chapter 20, how is this particular passage in, or in particular that particular word excised out of the literal and placed into the realm of symbolic. What rule was applied? That's my question. What rule was applied? Six times that word is, is in there. So reference is at a rule. So what do we do with the termination of the events at the end of the millennium that it, it talks about? So so Satan is bound for a thousand years. He's, he's released at the end. Um, this is why Revelation 20 must be rewritten in the mind of the all millennialists because it doesn't fit. So but here's an idea. It's kind of a novel idea. How about dump your bad theology if it doesn't agree with the Bible? You know, I've done it. I've had to do it. If you're honest with yourself, there are probably a few things in your walk with the Lord that you had wrong, that you had to dump because you've had some bad ideas, or a bad idea you learned from somebody, and um, you've had to jettison it because you found some scripture that showed you something else. Keep doing that. If you if you're reformed, you started off reformed with some excellent teachers um, regarding salvation in particular um, from over 500 years ago. Keep reforming. Bring it into your ecclesiology and your eschatology. There's other things in chapter 20. Why did you pick thousand? Why do you pick thousand to be one that's symbolic? How about the word Hades? How about Hades? Maybe that's symbolic. That's in chapter 22. Um, so why did you pick out just thousand? Maybe that's not really there. Maybe that's symbolic. What about the great white throne? Where's the great white throne elsewhere in the scripture? Maybe that's symbolic. Maybe we need to jettison that. Um, so unless you have a, a good reason for crashing the word thousand, then don't just do it because it doesn't, you know, frankly, frankly for me, it's, it's, just, it's just lazy. It's, you know, taking somebody else's word for it and not being the Berean and doing a little bit of research there. Now, I know there's a lot of time invested in it. Some, some of us maybe have written books, made videos, made recordings, We've got our favorite teachers, and we're not going to turn our backs on them because what all our, what all our friends think, you know, we can't, oh, I'll go to church and say, hmm, you know, guess what, guys? I don't think I'm an armor in this anymore. You know, I, it, sure, it's going to be kind of awkward, but, you know, um, you know, be brave, be bold, right? Or go home. Um, here's a question um, in, in, about the word thousand, okay? One of the objections will be saying, well, what about it when the Bible says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills? And that's all just kind of a distraction to show you that what well, the word thousand doesn't necessarily mean literal. But in, it, that comes from Psalm 50, and that's just God discussing um, sacrifice in Psalm 50. And he goes on to say, if you read the context, there's a novel idea. He's telling, he, he's telling us that 
I already own all the animals. You know, I own these animals, all the animals in the forest uses were all. And I you know, own the cattle on, on a thousand hills. So in other words, all of them. And what he's pleading for here, he's using um, hyperbole, hyperbolic language, exaggerative language to just say, I, I, I'm God. They're already mine. I don't, I don't need you to sacrifice your animals so that I can have them up here in heaven. You know, kill them so their spirits will come up here or whatever, like some of the pagans do. What I want is the worship attendant with your sacrifice. I, I don't need you to sacrifice your animals to me so that I can have them. They're already mine. And that's the point of Psalm 50 in the context. The context is important. And then the other one that's brought up and we around a lot is a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So the question is, does that mean we, every time the word thousand is used in the Bible, we're supposed to look at that verse and say, hey, word thousand, you know, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. But here's the problem is that by, that same verse also says a thousand years are as a day. So when... Jesus tells us that the Son of Man must be in the earth for three days. Does that really mean 3,000 years? You know, so that we be honest with the passages and, and understand that, you know, we use context to determine, is it being hyperbolic, is it being symbolic, or do we take it literally? So unfortunately, the historicists must nuke Revelation 20. And so that's why there's an attack on Revelation chapter 20 and the millennium itself. But um, how about it'd be a lot easier to just be honest with the text, okay? So that's my take on the word apocalyptic, um, speaking for myself, the dispensational view, how, and how we look at that passage and uh, apocalyptic literature, apocalyptic writing, and the reversal of the meaning of that that happens in amillennialism and, and post-millennialism. All right, so until next time. <laughs>